Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. And thank you so much for joining us today to talk about the critical role of play and playful learning as we start to emerge from COVID-19. I'm Helen Hadani, and I'm a fellow with both the Center for Universal Education, or CUE, and the ANT and Robert M. Bass Center for Transformative Placemaking. For those of you who aren't familiar with our centers, the Center for Universal Education generates evidence to impact policy and practice to improve both the quality and access of learning for children across the world. We strive to ensure that every child, no matter where they are living, has access to quality learning opportunities that they need to thrive in school and work and in citizenship. And the Bass Center for Transformative Placemaking is advancing a new integrated practice to build more connected, vibrant, and inclusive communities by inspiring public, private, and civic leaders to make transformative place investments that have both social and economic benefits. I'd like to take a moment to thank both the Bernard Van Leer Foundation and Anne and Bob Bass. The Bernard Van Leer Foundation provides generous support to the Center for Universal Education that makes our work possible. And Bob Bass is a trustee of the Brookings Institution and provides generous support to the Bass Center for Transformative Placemaking. We find ourselves at an exciting and hopeful moment as millions of citizens are getting vaccinated across the world and children and teachers are starting to return to their classrooms and their schools. While the pandemic has been life-changing in countless ways, it has also provided an unexpected opportunity for us to innovate and rebuild our education systems to better support all students. This means supporting new and creative ways to think about learning and education beyond the classroom, including in shared and public spaces. And one innovative approach for bringing education into the public realm is playful learning landscapes, which marries developmental science with placemaking to address learning inequalities and bring educational elements to spaces and places where families regularly go, including supermarkets, laundromats, bus stops, and, and libraries. The Playful Learning Landscapes Initiative at Brookings is a joint venture between the Center for Universal Education and the Bass Center and is part of a broader movement to transform everyday spaces into powerful learning opportunities for children and families. At the policy level, Brookings is bringing together city level decision makers and stakeholders in a community of practice to support the design and uptake of evidence-based playful learning landscapes, practices, and policies. And in collaboration with Temple University, through the leadership of professors Kathy Hirsch-Pasek and Roberta Golenkoff, and in partnership with the Playful Learning Landscapes Action Network based in Philadelphia, we are working to reimagine cities as supportive learning ecosystems to support children and families in ways that produce both tangible and measurable outcomes for children and the cities and communities where of Mayor Bill Peduto from Pittsburgh kick us off today with some keynote remarks. Pittsburgh, known as many to Kidsburg, has a long and rich history of supporting families and children 
and those who care for them. Following Mayor Peduto's remarks, we'll have a lively discussion moderated by my colleague, Jennifer Bay, and three city and community leaders that share our passion for the power of play, for learning, and for healing. We welcome your questions during this, the discussion via Twitter using hashtag learning landscapes or via email by sending your questions to events at brookings.edu. And now it's my distinct pleasure to turn things over to Mayor Caduto. Hi, I'm Bill Peduto, the mayor of the city of Pittsburgh. And in Pittsburgh, we have a long tradition of working to create new programming for children and using innovation in order to be able to teach. It goes back even further than Mr. Rogers. And we continue to find innovative ways to remake learning. If we learn something through 2020, through the global pandemic. It was that parks and open space are absolutely great equalizers for all people. They're free. They're open to everyone, no matter what your age or what your background. And for our children, they prove to be a respite from a global pandemic. But the other thing that we realized is that our open spaces, throughout our city can be reimagined and rethought of in different ways in order to provide healthy opportunities for our youngest residents. That's why we in Pittsburgh, we're proud to work with groups like Brookings in order to be able to reimagine how open space and open areas of public space can be even further utilized in order to create opportunities for our youngest residents. We had many challenges as we come out of a post-COVID world, but we have many opportunities to make things even better. Join us in other cities as we discuss those ways of how open space and public space can be utilized for all of our residents. Many thanks to Mayor Peduto for highlighting the importance of urban play spaces and the need for cities to center children in their recovery from COVID-19. And thanks to all of you for joining us today. I'm Jennifer Vey, I'm a senior fellow with the Metropolitan Policy Program and I'm the director of the Ante and Robert M. Bass Center for Transformative Placemaking at Brookings. So by now it certainly seems to be uh, quite an understatement to say that COVID-19 has dis disrupted nearly all aspects of our lives, including in, in varying ways and to varying degrees, how we work, how we shop, how we play, and how we connect with family and friends. But it's also sparked a lot of creativity in our cities and regions. For example, communities around the country have transformed sidewalks and other public spaces to accommodate outdoor dining and open streets to better support walking and biking and other kinds of recreational activities. Meanwhile, thousands of local education systems were pretty much forced to adopt and implement new innovations to support school-based learning. But COVID-19 has also generated new interest in innovations and efforts that complement traditional schooling, with a particular focus on how to provide new opportunities for children in disinvested neighborhoods that were hit particularly hard by the pandemic's health and economic impacts. Of course, long before COVID, we had large educational achievement gaps gaps that start pretty early. In fact, achievement gaps between cognitive and social skills of middle-income children and their peers from low-income families emerge as early as age three. This sets the trajectory that leads children from under-resourced areas to poor academic performance over time. Early childhood education is one of the most powerful mechanisms for bridging these gaps and increasing social mobility and economic opportunity. Recognizing this, for years, policymakers have focused on a whole range of top-down reforms to improve formal learning environments. That is through investments in preschool and, and particularly in, in K-12 educational systems. But such strategies, while obviously vital, ignore the 80% of waking time children spend outside the classroom with their families. 
a percent of time that in so many communities around the country obviously reached 100% this past year. Because of this, quality child care given our interactions, which occur outside of the school walls, are one of the most important factors for early development. Unfortunately, children experiencing poverty just have fewer opportunities to gauge in these interactions, as families living in lower resource environments often have low quality public infrastructure and public spaces, less access to high quality childcare, and more limited extracurricular activities than those in higher income communities. Those dispar disparities are also particularly wide among different racial and ethnic groups, given that black and brown children are far more likely to live in high poverty neighborhoods than non-Hispanic non white children. Evidence is already showing that related learning gaps among these groups have only widened during this past year. So all this speaks to the really urgent need for local and state and national leaders to advance bold solutions that foster long overdue investment and opportunity within disinvested communities, and to do so in a way that benefit existing residents, including children within them. So playful learning landscapes can, can be part of such a strategy. By addressing educational inequity through a holistic and community-based model, this approach sets in motion transformative and structural change at the individual level, at the family level, and at the whole community level that broadens that economic opportunity and encourages and fosters social mobility. Through fun and interactive installations located in everyday spaces that families frequent, some of which Helen mentioned, bus stops and supermarkets and laundromats, Playful Learning Landscapes encourages the development of critical skills and allows children from under-resourced neighborhoods to enter for more formal schooling on a more level playing field and really to continue to thrive in school and beyond. So, you know, of course there is no silver bullet for reducing inequality, but Playful Learning Landscapes offers a powerful solution with a whole wide range of outcomes. In the first place, it fosters a mindset shift among caregivers and communities around the role of caregiver and child interactions and play in fostering learning, including literacy and numeracy and spatial skills. At the same time, playful learning installations, particularly those that are in the public realm, promote social interaction among neighbors and just make cities more vibrant and livable for all residents. So today we're very fortunate to have a group of panelists who are going to talk about how they're integrating playful learning efforts in, in their communities and some of the challenges that they face in scaling that kind of work. We're also going to get their thoughts on how, as communities are working to recover from the impacts of COVID-19, people across the fields of child development and education and health and urban planning and design can together be reimagining just where and how children and families learn together. So I'd like to welcome Lisa Ratcliffe, Ratliff, who's the Chief Executive Officer of Kaboom, Rigo Rodriguez, who's the Board President of the Santa Ana Unified School District, and the Chair of the Chicano and Latino Studies Department at California State University, Long Beach. And he's, he's also a founder and active member of the Santa Ana Early Learning Initiative, which I know we're going to hear a lot about today. And Chayate Sekin, who's both a professor at Istanbul Technical University, and also the head of parks and recreation for the city of Istanbul. So let's all dive in. So what I wanna do is I wanna start by just learning a little bit about each of you and your work in this space. Um, so, you know, basically let's talk a little bit about just what, what you're each doing around playful learning and what are the challenges that you're trying to specifically address through these kind of efforts. So let's go ahead and start with Lisa. Um, Lisa, I know Kaboom is really focused on play-space equity, working in communities all around the country to help build new and improved play infrastructure, rooted in the knowledge that play is just vital to kids and their physical and emotional health. Can you talk a little bit about the history and the work of Kaboom and especially your Play Everywhere initiative? How and in what circumstances does Kaboom incorporate aspects of playful learning into your installations and play structures? both in playgrounds, but also in the public realm. Absolutely, thank you, Jennifer. And it's just such a pleasure to be here. I'm Lisa Ratliff, I'm the CEO of Kaboom. And um, just as a backdrop, we are um, an organization that it has been primarily known as one that builds playgrounds. So for the past 25 years, we've been bringing communities and kids together to design, envision, and then build their very own play space. 
Um, we've used volunteers historically to do that work. And so there really is a sense of cohesion and connectivity through how we work. Um, and I think you, you raised a lot of these points in your opening, you know, we exist because there is a history in this country of racialized disinvestment. And so the work that we do is really trying to address the inequities um, that exist because we have disinvested um, throughout the history of our country in specific, in specific communities. And so there are three big focus areas for us. And one is equity. You know, we want to achieve place-based equity. We, I think all look around at these amazing, fantastic, learning rich environments for kids. We want that to exist for everyone. Um, community, it is important to us that community be the loudest voice at the table. So we work really hard to listen to and respond to whatever is special and unique about that community in terms of what they might need, what uh, might be missing, um, and then what's possible for them because of the assets that exist in that community. And then place is the third piece. You know, we uh, just want to make sure that we're creating safe, uh, learning rich environments that really invite and encourage kids to come out and play. I mean, you mentioned that more than 80% of kids time is being spent outside of the classroom. And so you know, I say this often that the currency for kids is play. And so we want to make sure that we are investing in place, uh, place in a way that um, focuses on understanding the problem first, and then being able to scale it. Um, and then creating space where they can learn outside of school. Uh, I, I want to um, share my screen because I think some of the images that I have really speak much better than the words that I can use around how we've adapted over the years. So where we've historically been known for our playgrounds, we have had to adapt along the way to make sure that we are being responsive to making sure that all communities, all kids have easy access. So play is the easy option. So that learning through play is the easy option. And so over time, we've done things like partner with Too Small to Fail to start including panels on our playgrounds. Um, but then a couple of years ago, we uh, launched what we call Play Everywhere, which is still the you know, same thing, playful learning landscapes, uh, which is really using our community asset based model for communities to come together and reimagine in their space. Um, really looking at places like um, vacant lots, um, bus stops, laundromats, um, you know, where families and kids are spending a lot of time, but they're not um, necessarily having um, that time to be able to learn. And so here, this is, I'm sharing my screen. Here we go. Um, let just walk through these images with me for a second um, because they're magic. We're going back. <laughs> so this, you know, so looking here, this is what I'm talking about. These are, you know, the everyday spaces that we're used to where families often spend a lot of time. I know I spent a lot of time at laundromats. Um, I was reflecting with a colleague the other day that as a little girl, uh, I would, um, I'm horrified to say this out loud, but I would play in laundromats by getting in the dryer <laughs> and having my friends spin me around in circles. Rigo's feeling me here, but spin me around in circles. And now as a mom and um, uh, advocate of safe, um, playful learning, I am horrified by that thought. And so for us, it's really important to make sure we're going to where kids and families are to create safe spaces, learning rich environments. So looking at these bus stops and train stations and vacant lots and reimagining them with communities so they look more like this. So the one with the little kiddo who's doing, a, doing kind of do, doing a handstand, that's a playful bench in Miami. The middle one, you can't quite see it um, where there's the white um, structure. That is a bus stop. That is a huge swing. Um, the one on the right is right in front of a school. It's where the kids catch the bus. It's um, Bright, uh, Brightmore Runway where kids are now running <laughs> along the path and getting their time on that little digital um, sign up there. Um, you'll see learning elements in the bottom where there's numbers and racing. This one here, this is in uh, Mount Clemens, Michigan. 
this um, stairway it was re-envisioning the stairway where there's learning elements. You see the math there. Apparently there's a secret message in those stairs that um, I'm too stubborn to ask what it is because I want to figure it out. But there is a secret kind of encoded message within those stairs um, for kids to even look further beyond the map, beyond the colors, beyond the physical activity, beyond the connectivity that happens while they're learning with whatever caregiver they're with. Um, this is in Lexington, Kentucky. It's a transit center and it was is an incredibly busy hub where families are spending a lot of time. And you look at that one photo that lacks color, lacks anything that invites kids. Um, they re-envisioned their space so that there's puzzles and mazes. And so while, while kids are waiting for their transit or their bus, they're able to play and learn with their families. Um, a couple more here, this is Atlanta, the MARTA station, it's an underpass there, just re-envisioning re again what would be normally be downtime and very boring, um, re-envisioning it as a learning rich, playful environment. Um, Miami, this space was designed by the kids, um, like many of these, where this is, a. am sharing this because this is a vacant lot. And so you imagine a lot like this that would attract a lot of crime normally. But when you re-envision it and you um, put these learning elements in colorful spaces, it says kids belong here. Fun stuff is happening here. Um, learning is happening here. And so crime is not happening here because this is where kids come to play. Um, just, I think there's maybe one or two more here. This one is um, lovely. This is um, Rochester, New York. It's a library. Um, the kids wanted to make the, in the outside of the library more engage, engaging. So they brought the whole storybook concept outside. And so you see the entryway, not just invites people into the library, but really brings the stories and books to life. The path at the bottom is a storybook path that wraps around the library. And that's it, let me stop my share, but I, I thought there, would, there was no words <laughs> that I could speak that would really start to illustrate how we've had to adapt our model where you, you know, envision playgrounds where it's almost like a destination where kids go and families go, um, which is absolutely important. We need to make sure that those are in our schools, in our communities, but we needed to adapt to make sure that we were bringing play to communities where kids were to make play the easy option and allow them to learn through that play. And so we've done more than 300 of those installations. No two look alike um, because they are truly designed by the community um, and with others that are in that space. Um, so, you know, for us, that's kind of been our evolution. And we, um, we know, I think well, all of us know, you know what happens uh, through play, the learning that can happen, both um, physical, academic, you know, we learn to negotiate relationships, we learn to take our first risks, we learn to um, do math problems and um, decipher logic and literacy and learning, that all can happen through literacy rich um, learning places. The trick is making them more accessible to kids and communities. Thank you so much, Lisa. And I, I just loved all those, all those images. It's, you're right. I mean, it's, it's really hard almost, you know, uh, wrap your head around a lot of this until you actually see it in action. And, and so many of these photos actually see the kids. And I, I especially like the the one with the running, um, because my family has been known to actually try that on on streets where they have those those uh, timer the the speed limit signs up for cars and seeing if it actually works for uh, for running. So it's it's great that somebody actually figured out how to how to do this um, for, for kids in the in the public realm. It's really neat. Um, all right, I'm going to turn it over to to Rigo. I so you're a professor. You're also president of Santa Ana's School Board, uh, which gives you a, a really great perspective on these issues. But you're also really involved in the Santa Ana Early Learning Initiative. So can you tell us a little bit how Sally um, came to be? Uh, who does it serve, and what are some of your key goals? Uh, sure. Thank you, Jennifer. And uh, again, my name is Rigo, and I'm so glad that Lisa started us off because those images are powerful. They're powerful in the sense that they give us uh, possibilities that unless you know about these playful learning landscapes and these concepts, uh, then at the local level here in Santa Ana and in other cities, 
we just don't know that these options exist. And so I'm so glad that Lisa started first and that she shared some personal stories about the, the dryer, <laughs> which reflects uh, you know, experiences that happen down here in Santa Ana as well. Uh, Santa Ana is also uh, an example of a racialized, underinvested city, like many in the United States. And, um, and so others created a physical landscape, a built landscape for those of us who now live in these places. And that these built environments essentially uh, that are park poor and have very few opportunities for folks, and for, for our little ones, uh, they essentially are robbing our ch the childhood from our children. And so uh, this is really, today's session is really important in that we can uh, imagine innovative ways of making sure our communities and our children have those uh, developmental opportunities. Uh, so uh, in terms of Santa Ana, uh, SALI, which stands for the Santa Ana Early Learning Initiative, started back in uh, 2016. And we're basically a coalition of parents, uh, uh, nonprofit organizations, schools, elementary schools uh, in, in this city uh, that are dedicated to promoting the well being of children zero to eight, with an emphasis on zero to three. So it's zero to eight, but zero to three is really our entry point. Um, <clears throat> we're a very active coalition. Let me just say a little bit about our accomplishments and then I have more comments that I'll infuse in later questions, but just to give folks. So the, the la, from 2016 to about 2019, uh, our focus was really around school reform. Um, not so much open space. We know that 80% of the kids uh, waking life is out in the community, but we really wanted to make sure that the school system was operating well. And as a school board member, I took the opportunity to make sure that our, our fellow, my fellow board members were also invested in early education. And I, I must say there was no opposition uh, on the school board to do this work. So folks that are school board members elsewhere, it's really hard to say no to children zero to five, especially because they're gonna matriculate into your preschools and kindergartens. And your teachers are gonna love the fact that those kids come in much more prepared, right? So um, uh, in 2017, we, we um, you know, uh, not, uh, gently pressured the district to adopt a comprehensive early learning framework. And that led to increasing our preschools from 16 to 27 of our 35 elementary schools. Uh, in those preschools, we also increased the pay for our preschool teachers. Uh, we also reduced the class size for kindergarten. Uh, uh, and we also increased uh, from half day to full day kinder, but we made sure that the full day included lots of play activities. So it's not just like hammering and drilling more, uh, you know, math and that's, but we did that, but it was through, through playful activities. Um, and then uh, we did extended day from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Parents could uh, have their kids in our schools, again, with very thoughtful, active learning, especially for the young ones. Uh, we also uh, established wellness centers in all of our elementary schools where parents, even if their kids didn't go to those schools, they could still access those. And um, uh, lastly, we uh, uh, created a, a $3 million uh, three-year initiative to incentivize creative, innovative ways of connecting preschool, kinder, first and all the way to third grade. So we launched all this work and by the end of 2019, using the early development index as our primary gauge, I'll talk more about that assessment later on. We were able to show that we were, we statistically reduced the child vulnerability in the target neighborhoods. Uh, and so um, the last thing I'll say is that throughout this whole time, we heavily, heavily invested in parent leadership development because what we wanted to do is, is make sure that those parents that were active in those, uh, in this case, it's 13 schools, that they became the anchor for our neighborhood leadership teams because those same parents, when their kids finish elementary school, they, they're still in that neighborhood. We do all this investment in parent leadership development, but once their kids leave our schools, we don't, we're like, we don't care about them, right? Uh, but no, what we thought is, no, let's, let's invest in parent leadership development because they remain in their neighborhoods and they can form a neighborhood leadership team. And I'll say more about what we've done there because with the neighborhood leadership teams and those active parents, that's how we then bridged over to the playful learning landscapes in our parks, in our neighborhoods, et cetera. So that's kind of a snapshot of uh, the Santa Ana Early Learning Initiative or SALI. 
Great, thanks so much. Uh, wow, what a what a just an amazing uh, array of efforts that that Sally is really working to undertake. So, um, Chai Tay, I'm going to turn to you. Uh, you teach at the university, uh, but also re fairly recently became the head of Parks and Recreation for the City of Istanbul. So, what are your department's major ambitions? around increasing play and, and learning through play, particularly in the city of Istanbul. Okay, Th thank you, Jennifer. Um, actually, one of the basic principles of our, uh, you know, play Istanbul concept, uh, actually, I would like to start with main focus for us. So, I'm sorry. Our main focus during the COVID-19 pandemic was um, establishing playful learning communities and to provide a new vision for play. And uh, our priority as Parks and Recreation Department uh, was increasing social awareness uh, on the importance of natural areas and the need to protect ecosystem diversity in the city. In this regard, digital tools on learning through play were an um, inevitable part of our program during these challenging days when gathering in a physical environment was impossible. Uh, we organized several playful events in the theme of sustainability, especially uh, putting on focus uh, learning sustainable development goals to children and uh, adolescents. Also, uh, the need for a long-term approach for the public realm resulted in with the Play Istanbul initiative. Uh, what is Play Istanbul actually? St Play Istanbul is a local government initiative established by the Istanbul Metropolitan Municipality Departments of Parks and Recreation in 2020. It's a new model for local planning that determines outdoor play and learning through play. Uh, model accepts recreation and play as the focal point uh, for creating more livable city and happier Istanbul. Uh, what we have to consider primarily in the planning for play is the good level of coordination within the uh, Istanbul Metropolitan Municipality Departments and cooperation with the public and communities. And our another great achievement for us during the pandemic was the establishment for orienteering activity in the, some our spaces such as urban forest, Atatürk urban forest, which provides a high sensory play experience within the natural landscape and gives the opportunity to get in touch and learn basic ecosystem components to children and individuals. Um, based on increasing demand and interest, we aim to further develop orienteering routes in green spaces as well as urban environment to create inviting recreation services for all users. Uh, I would like to continue with Play Istanbul because one of uh, the basic principles of our Play Istanbul concept is inclusion. It's very important for us. In this sense, we address increasing awareness on the right to play and leisure, but we realize that uh, not every district in Istanbul has the same opportunities and spreading the game around the city would not be that easy when we confined it to playgrounds. For this reason, we started to meet with children by establishing mobile playgrounds uh, with various equipment and playmakers where we can set up the game. So we did it several places during pandemic. And new field playgrounds are uh, prioritized by considering the districts where there is a lot of need. Enhancing consciousness on the right to participate in design and planning decisions, and uh, most importantly, to include children at various ages in the process, have been important points for our department. Uh, I would like to give you a particular example, actually, uh, from Akbaba Park. It's very important for us. Maybe I can. Uh, show you its video right now. Um, just a moment, please. Excuse me. I'm sorry, I wasn't able to do that. So I, I will continue with my words. What we aim is actually in Beko's Akboba is to enhance the uh, attractiveness of our outdoor spaces and encourage children to go out and experience the physical environment and also to choose exercising instead of playing in front of the computer. 
so we know that participation in decision making is particularly important in order to increase the sense of belonging, uh, responsibility, tolerance, and relationship. In this regard, um, surprising playful learning landscape as hotspots that boost social interaction in the city is within our reach as well. So considering all of these, our main objective on a playable Istanbul is to create a play culture within a playful, friendly society and to change stereotypes around play and recreation in the city. In a playable Istanbul play, um, according to our decision, play has no age, no gender, no constraints. So we would like to design spaces for everyone. So uh, uh, maybe I would like to put emphasis as another thing, the challenges we experience regarding inclusion and access of disabled individuals to recreation and play services. And uh, this is very important thing. And this has been one of the most challenging issue for us uh, to address communities while planning and designing green spaces. Uh, Jennifer, if you don't mind, I will. I would like to try one more time that uh, show that video. Uh, can you can you see there? Burası. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. İstanbul'un en şirin köylerinden birisi. Beykoz Akbaba Köyü. Biz de şu anda Akbaba Köyü'nün çocuk parkına bakıyoruz. Actually, we are looking to children park at Akbaba. Ama burada bir şeyler değişmek üzere. Görevliler hummalı bir çalışma içindeler. Neden mi? Actually, we are trying to change all equipments and we would like to design with these children this park. Our department and our children from Istanbul we get together and we started to design to, together with children. The, actually, the name of this project, uh, Children of Istanbul are designing their parks. Çocukların gözünde nitelik olarak yeterli olmayan oyun alanları onların hayal gücüne ve tasarım yeteneklerine bırakıyor. I think we might not be able to be fully seeing the video. It's not advancing at least on my screen. I didn't hear you. I'm sorry that. The video I don't think the video seems to be advancing for some reason. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, I tried to show you, you the video because at the video actually uh, our students, uh, our children from different schools uh, get together and uh, they work with uh, their teachers or playmakers and they started to design some playground equipments and then at the end of the story uh, they all designed this, uh, maybe I can show some pictures. Uh, just a moment, please. Uh, here you are. You see those pictures? Okay. And the, uh, they, they came together and they started to design their uh, projects with their, uh, this is our mayor, Ekrem Imamoğlu, and these are our playmakers and uh, those students. And also they designed all this park, all drawings with our architects and designers. And at the end of the project, they built their designs. And this is a very exciting project for us. And we opened it 23rd of April uh, last year. Uh, it's a, how can I say, it's a big festival for us, the Children's Day. Uh, and so, we got together with our children and we opened that park on that day and we designed it with uh, community participation or especially children participation. Okay, that's all, uh, that's all right now, right now. And maybe uh, in the future I can say more words. Absolutely. Um, no, thank you. And thank, for, thank you for sharing some of those, those photos. It's great to see uh, kids actually getting involved in the design of these spaces. So I want to pivot a little bit to talk about the impacts of COVID-19. Uh, I think all of you referenced them in, in one way or another. And I want to hear from you all how, you know, while, while all your efforts predated COVID-19, clearly, over the past 14 months, how have you really seen the pandemic affecting opportunities for both learning and, and play? We know in, in some ways many of the challenges of COVID-19 on play, 
but how has this also maybe opened up some new thinking, some new opportunities in the communities in which you work or, or how have you, you know, what does this mean for your work even moving, moving forward? So let's start uh, this time with Rigo. Um, how did the Santa Ana schools respond to COVID-19 and what were some of the dis disparate impacts on the community served by the school? And then how in turn did this change Sally's approach to its work? Um, you know, what are some of the innovations in the school system itself regarding play and learning, but, but even outside of that, particularly in the, in the public realm? Uh, yeah, so uh, Santa Ana, uh, in, in the context of Orange County down here in Southern California, uh, Santa Ana was hit really hard by COVID-19. Uh, so when the stay and shelter order came down in March of 2020 by our governor, the parks were immediately closed and the schools were immediately closed, meaning that two places where children spend their time were closed. And we are one of the youngest cities in the country, meaning we have a larger proportion of younger kids. So we were disproportionately impacted. Um, and we're also one of the most park poor cities in the country. So when you layer all of that, you can see the disparate impact that that closing schools and closing parks has on a city like ours. In addition to that, uh, the uh, Santa Ana is where many of the essential workers are located and where they live that serve the rest of the county. So folks who work in the grocery stores, people who work in, the, in, in other places that still involve farm workers, for example, that still involve everyday work. Uh, we are also one of the most overcrowded, in other words, number of people per household. And so the COVID-19 rates just shot through the roof in Santa Ana. And so schools became first responders. So I, as a school board president, along with my colleagues on the board, uh, focused on making sure we had a, a system of food delivery for our children, seven days a week uh, through the summer. We had to make sure that our family and community workers, I, I mentioned the wellness centers that, I, uh, that we established. So we also hired family and community engagement workers. And so our wellness centers were closed, but then our family and community workers were linking parents and families to unemployment um, resources, uh, information about housing, because there was a lot of eviction happening at that time. So we became basically first responders, but at that same time, we invested in the the platform, the distance learning platform. So we basically got uh, Wi-Fi, uh, and, and to our kids, meaning our families also were able to get access to uh, Wi-Fi, which they didn't have before. And you'll see that that's a really critical pivot point for us in what I'll say later, uh, and because we had to go to distance learning on a dime, right? Uh, and then um, we also became one of the primary sources of information around social distancing, masks, uh, that sort of uh, thing to be able to, we, we essentially launched an educational campaign that really the responsibility was of the county to do that, but we basically just took it upon ourselves to, to really deal with the essentials. The, the, um, and now what we're also doing is we're coordinating the vaccination campaigns because the county, and this is true in, in most cities in the United States for underinvested cities, uh, it's also where resources come to us last. And so we've been doing a lot of advocacy. Now, having said that, like, so how does that impact Saley? Well, Saley is a private public coalition, right? So we're not, we're not uh, the school uh, system, we are a coalition. Uh, and so we were able to move a little bit more nimbly as well as shift gears quickly. So there's three ways in which um, we shifted gears. One is, and, and all of these shifts happen on the basis of the virtual platform because right? we couldn't meet face to face. So all those investments that the school did to make sure that our parents and our families had access to devices and to hotspots and that sort of thing, we then built on that so that we could keep our meetings going as, and if you can see the virtual background, uh, it, that's, these are the parents uh, that evolved in Saley. Right? We used to be able to meet together uh, once a month, 125 parents and really do coordination. Well, that was taken uh, um, from under us, right? So the shift to the virtual platform was crucial, but that was enabled by a school district investment, if you're following me here. 
And so, um, so three things. One is we began to coordinate our services virtually. So service coordination was critical, but that's something we were already doing. We just shifted over to a virtual platform. But the second part is really new. And that is um, we started to focus on the co-design for uh, playful learning landscapes using that virtual space as well. So uh, Dr. Andres Bustamante from UC Irvine, who has a lot of experience and background on playful learning landscapes, he got a grant and uh, when we had gotten the grant pr prior to COVID. So we were thinking, how are we gonna do this? Uh, and so about 35 to 40 of those parents that you see in the background have been involved in similar to what uh, Play uh, Istanbul is doing, but instead of involving the children in the design of playful learning landscapes, we're involving the parents. So at home, they get their kits and so they develop their, their uh, vision at home uh, and then virtually they share it and then they talk and they learn. This is really important because often parents, uh, particularly marginalized parents, are, are simply asked to do this and that, but they're never also invited to be creative themselves, right? It's almost like, oh, they're not kids. They're not gonna be engaging in playful, right? But no, the, the act of creativity, I think it was Lisa who said that or someone that, that it, it's, it's all of us, it's not just contained to children. That was really, that's probably the most innovative piece because I think through that process of creating images uh, of what a playful learning landscape could look like, is where we've begun now to go into our third innovative and last kind of strategy. We have shift, we have added to our service coordination, we've added an advocacy arm. So those same parents that are involved in thinking about creative space are now involved in advocating to make sure that the city and the school district invest in these installations. And so we already have some wins. For example, there's a, a lot of work that the city is doing around Main Street Corridor. Well, they've already invited us to give ideas for an installation, right? So the city is already paying for that. So now we're infusing that into that uh, project. And then uh, lastly, um, we also um, passed a bond called Measure I, about $245 million. So we're now infusing playful learning landscape concepts into our modernization projects. And I should mention one more thing, a fraction ball. So uh, Dr. Andres Bustamante is um, basically teaching us how to turn a basketball court in our, in our schools into fraction balls. So instead of just shooting one pointers and two pointers, we actually create fractions. So it's uh, uh, one shot counts for a third or one half, right? And so all of that uh, is uh, being built into our schools. We're, we're uh, implementing that in one elementary school. The idea is to, to uh, scale that up across all of our elementary schools. So I think that the, these three ways I think have been really instrumental in, in kind of shifting ourselves towards designing playful learning landscapes and then infusing them into uh, our daily operations, both for the city and for the school district. Thanks so much. And I, you know, I really appreciate hearing about kind of the intersectionality between all these things and how, how it's all built, um, how they've all built on each other. So uh, let's turn to Chai Te, um, sort of the, the same thing. How did, how did COVID-19 influence the park department's efforts um, and play Istanbul and the other efforts that you have going on? And if you could talk a little bit too about, you know, as you've been making these shifts, what are you, what are you up against? What are you finding are some of the biggest barriers to just to just get done what you want to get done in the city. Uh, you know, actually the biggest barrier is the financial barriers, but uh, <clears throat> during this period, actually uh, the, co the common point, the common barrier for all of us maybe was the limits and the rules to the COVID-19. Uh, at this point, nature is, uh, according to our uh, approach, nature is uh, actually the only place that can open its arms to us. So uh, we tried the solution uh, working in nature. We started, for example, a new campaign called Hug a Tree and Embrace Nature for people uh, to share their moments of contact with nature with everyone. And we observed that people awareness uh, about importance of nature has increased. And, uh, <clears throat> and also the, you know, uh, COVID-19 pandemic has evidently resulted in increasing demand on outdoor public spaces, 
but uh, the pandemic was characterized also as a, a period of opportunities to increase social awareness on the uh, importance of public and green spaces and to develop fresh ideas and projects on the public domain. Uh, in this sense, uh, our department focused on engaging with communities through playful learning activities that put a strong emphasis on the sustainability of green and natural areas in the city. Uh, what further developed during the pandemic is the idea that uh, open green spaces could be as classrooms and potentially integrate with the idea of natural playful learning landscapes. Uh, for example, before the pandemic period, we had a project for schools called A Bread, a Bread in Recess. Uh, and we wanted by doing this project to create awareness about urban agriculture and nature love by touching the soil where students can plant something during their playtime and throw off their energy with the soil. This was also another important project during that period and we uh, continued it uh, during our uh, during our pandemic uh, process, pandemic period, sorry. Uh, also, uh, as you know, COVID-19 is very turning point on the importance of, as I told you before, availability of green and natural spaces. Uh, first of all, it surely increased, as uh, mentioned before, the dem uh, is demand on financial capac capacity for investment in green spaces. Uh, by spurring more investment in green spaces, COVID-19 made us realize more how accurate our goals actually were. So this encouraged us to achieve our goals regarding the playful city. Uh, to deal with this issue, we motivated on developing alternative ideas and implementations for recreation services to meet demand on open play activities within the city. For example, uh, we created mobile, mobile play equipments and travel around the city. We also accept play as a cultural experience, a learning tool that can touch the history and identity of the urban spaces. And also, for example, one of our projects for dispersing play throughout the city is uh, Gateway to Dreams. Uh, Gateway to Dreams, yes, it's right. In fact, it's a project uh, where we can make people smile when they look at a cheesy underpass below the concrete pile of the city. I will show a picture of that. Especially in this period, our main goal uh, uh, basically was to show that there are details that can make people happy. Uh, right now, uh, I will show that picture immediately. Uh, for example, yes, this one is fine. Can you see this one? Uh -huh. uh, it's a bridge and we uh, made some paintings on it. You see, we put some graphics. This is the previous and the part. You will remember those figures from cartoons and stuff. So we tried to create some places like that. So. Uh, as I told you before, we, uh, we would like to uh, create some details to people uh, that can make people happy. So these are all doing during the uh, pandemic process, I think. That's great. Um, I love the pictures. <laughs> Thank you for sharing them. So uh, Lisa, you know, I know early on in the pandemic, you know, a lot of outdoor spaces were closed. Kaboom was really trying to respond by providing guidance for, you know, how they could safely reopen around the country. But when you look for, you know, how has the pandemic really shaped Kaboom's kind of longer view of its approach? Is, has, has this really been a, a real pivot point for you all? And as you think about that long approach, if you could talk a little bit about what, what you think, you know, you're up against in, in terms of um, you know, the barriers that, that you're, you might face in implementing this vision. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and I, this time I'm really glad that Rigo and Tete went first because, you know, for us at the, early, at the beginning of the pandemic, it was important for us to step back and make sure that 
We were creating space for our community partners to focus on the immediate needs, the health needs, the food needs, all of the needs that they might have. Um, and then we did, we, we spent that time bringing a task force together, knowing that the pandemic would only um, exasperate disparities that already exist. So we brought a, a task force together to look at creating guidelines that would um, be accessible to anybody who needed them to be able to safely reopen. And we used those guidelines with some of our partners like in Baltimore and in San Francisco to help them safely reopen. But I mean, you, you talk about a pivotal moment in our history and I would put that in all caps with about a thousand exclamation points. And so that we have this 25 year strong history of doing great work with communities we had been spending the past couple of years just really looking at um, the role that we would need to take and making sure that we were truly focused on achieving place-based equity. And so we used a lot of the time thinking about how do we um, reorient ourselves around data because it is like the ultimate currency. And so on the front end, how do we need to reinvest and build out our organization to ensure that we're using assessments to identify where we work so that we're closing disparity gaps and would um, hold us accountable and hold um, our partners accountable to going into community and staying until the problem was solved at the scale it exists. And then on the back end to really start to build the partnerships, the external partnerships that would allow us to measure the outcomes of our work. Um, and that's showing up in all ways with playful learning landscapes. It's looking at the laundromats that um, the playful literacy rich um, spaces that we're doing in laundromats to hire a research to study the impact and outcomes of that space, to look at work, the playful learning landscape work that we're doing in Philly to um, go back to community and first do a baseline and then look at what has changed in terms of learning and cohesion in that space. We also, um, we had been doing a little bit of uh, government affairs work, but we doubled down, on, um, doubled down on our government affairs work and we partnered with the independent sector to form an, an advisory group of more than 50 nonprofits and philanthropic peers that could really focus on advocating and advising federal government on investments that they would make in infrastructure, equity, civic infrastructure. Um, because though we're doing great work um, without that federal prioritization of putting money into communities through an equitable lens and prioritizing kids in those infrastructure decisions, we wouldn't be able to meet the moment of moving the needle at the scale we need to. We did a lot of other things. We adapted mm -hmm. our normal approach. Um, we had, like I said, we had kind of stepped back to make sure we weren't overburdening communities. But when we went, we'd been doing um, playful learning landscapes, play everywhere challenge in Western New York in Southeast uh, Michigan. And when we went to our partners there, they said, no, don't stop. We need this more than ever. We need to make sure that this continues because our kids can't be indoors. We need to be creating these spaces outside for them to either come back to or to have in the meantime. And so we continued our um, playful learning work in Western New York, Southeast Detroit, um, Bay Area, Philly, um, just to ensure that we are we were appropriately and continue to appropriately work with community to address um, space needs for kids right now. Um, and then lastly, uh, you know, we had been spending years just really looking at all of these things that are special about us where, you know, we are amplifying community voice and we are engaging volunteers in our process in um, a way that is meaningful, but we acknowledge that the volunteer engagement piece might be um, getting in the way of us focusing truly on impact. So we wanted to be able to position ourselves to do um, move beyond project level work and move toward kind of um, program um, impact level work. And so we spent this past year really reorienting ourselves around being able to do that. We still built 
I think 41 playgrounds last year. So we engaged virtually. I think, you know, everybody's using Zoom or the equivalent of we engaged virtually with our communities to make sure they were still informing design. We engaged virtually with our volunteers um, and realized just how important it was to continue to build those spaces because I think we all recognize that we have to have alternate alternative solutions for our kids to still be able to be kids and to learn and to grow and to do the things that they need to in times where they're not able to go into like confined spaces or into the classroom. So it's a big year for us. <laughs> um, on and on, but it's a big year. And I think a really important year as we think about um, truly being part of making an impact um, in partnership with our peers and with communities. Thanks so much. And unfortunately I see that we are we're out of time. We can, I, there's so many more questions to ask. There's so much more we could talk about. Rigo, I know you have a lot to say about this issue around measurement and impact, for example, because you're doing a lot of it. And we'll look for other ways to, to get you to tell that story, um, certainly. Um, but first of all, thank you all so much for participating in this panel. Um, I know I really learned a lot. I, I, it, was, it was so wonderful to hear about all the efforts that you're involved in. Um, towards just just you know making our our cities making our spaces more playful and to just to to be better uh, for for children and families which which of course we know is just so important as we're looking to recover from what's been a, a really long and and difficult um, fifteen months for everyone so thank you all again thanks to our audience for joining us and keep following the work we'll we'll look for more opportunities to hear from our panelists um, to you know to do more writing we're doing a lot in this space so please continue to follow the work because there's a lot of exciting things going on uh, around the globe. So thanks very much and enjoy your day. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.